This is my brother Ian. Yeah, the one with the early 80s hair helmet. Good thing my hair looked badass back then. Anyway, he's been in London for the past 10 years and recently moved to, for some reason, St. Louis. His new place is pretty empty, so I'm helping him out by making as much of his new furniture as possible, starting with a dining table. He wanted something mid-century modern, and frankly guys, I'm having a little MCM fatigue. So I'm going to try to design something that makes him happy while also sneaking in some subtle curves to make me happy. Don't worry, be happy now. To work out some of the angles, I find SketchUp indispensable. I can quickly play with various angles and dimensions and at least get close to something that I think looks good. By the way, if you want to get good at SketchUp, be sure to check out our intro to SketchUp course over at the Wood Whisperer Guild. I'll put a link in the description for you. Once I have a general idea of where I'm going, I head to the shop and make a full-size drawing. SketchUp is fantastic, but at least the way that my brain works, I still sometimes need to see a full-size representation before making any final decisions. Ouch. Stop. Now let's talk about the tiny hairy black elephant in the room. I've never had a shop cat before. I don't know if they're all like this, but I feel like mine might be broken. If there's somewhere I can go to have him repaired, please let me know. Anyway, I made several iterations, playing with the angles, curves, and different shapes of the aprons and the rails. I also did something I almost never have the opportunity to do. I made a prototype. Feeling pretty confident in the design direction, I went to grab some of that sweet juicy walnut. Would you like some uh, juice? Look at that beefy boy. Hubba, hubba, hubba. So first up, I'll make the legs. I transferred the measurements to a piece of quarter inch ply and used the track saw to cut out a handy little template. To get the most attractive legs possible, I'm highlighting the grain lines and using those for reference when deciding on the template's position. Ideally, I'll be able to get all four legs from the same board for color and grain continuity. On another board, I'll lay out the various rails. And now for some jigsaw action. might be one of the dumbest sequences I've ever done. When I have parts laid out on large boards like this, I prefer to use a jigsaw to break things down into smaller, more manageable parts before heading to the bandsaw. The stock here is pretty thick, and one of the mistakes I've made in the past is not letting go of that thickness. I mean, walnut is expensive, and I have it, so why not use it? But in the end, leaving pieces too thick can make a design look clunky and also makes the furniture needlessly heavy. So I'm resawing the boards down to a more visually appropriate thickness for the scale of the piece. I can reserve the thin slices for another project in the future. The rails get the same treatment. Now I can joint and plane the legs to one and a half inches and the rails to one and a quarter inch. Next, I'll use the template to trace out the leg shape. To help me see the line easily, I'm using a white pencil. You don't need this specific mechanical pencil as the white lead will fit any 0.9 millimeter pencil. But when you're writing utensil drawer looks like this, it's always nice having one that stands out from the rest. I'll put links in the description for this stuff if you're interested. Now I'll cut the legs to shape, staying just outside of the pencil line. To flush trim, I'll attach the template with some double stick tape. Because I'm far too busy to take two passes, I'm using one of the largest, meanest looking bits I own, the Big Daddy bit sold by William Ng. As daunting as it is, you can do some amazing things with it, and if you're good at keeping the work against the bearing, you can even safely route to the end grain like this. The top side rails are then cut to 15 degrees at each end. Quick tip, save the offcuts on projects like this as they'll usually come in handy later for clamping. Now let's pivot to the joinery. When angles are involved, there's no easier way to make a mortise and tenon than to use the domino. Of course, you have to have one to use it. On projects like this, I love being able to focus more on the overall design and less on the intricacies of the joinery. I mean, my poor little brain can only handle so much at once.
With the joinery dry fit, I'll bring the legs and the top rail together with a clamp using those offcut pieces I mentioned before as angled calls. I'll now locate and fit the bottom rail. Here I just sneak up on the fit that leads to the rail being in the exact location I want it to be. And now I can lay out and cut the joinery for that bottom rail. And yet, another dry assembly. We're going to do a lot of those. Always make sure that the clamps are snug before lifting the piece. And now walk away like a smooth criminal. The long aprons need a bevel cut on the top edge. I want the face of the apron to be parallel to the outside edge of the leg, so we need to account for the off 90 angle on the top edge. On the ends of the long apron, I'll cut a 10 degree miter, which accounts for the leg assemblies tilting inwards by 10 degrees. Hopefully your head is spinning as much as mine is with all these angles. Again, we'll use the domino to attach the apron to the leg. Another quick dry assembly, and I can now measure for the stretcher. This is actually a pretty important part of the structure, and it'll add a lot of strength to the base. There's too many variables at play, so the only way that I can get this right is to sneak up on it. I also might need to fudge the bevel angle a bit just to close any gaps. Because the stretcher is likely to push the leg assemblies apart during test fits, I drop a clamp on top and just snug it up to the point that it resists the forces that the stretcher might apply. Once I have the perfect fit, I can lay out for the dominoes. Unfortunately, the fence on the domino doesn't have enough capacity to make this cut. So I'll have to come up with a different way. I'll use a small piece of plywood scrap as a fence and cut the mortises on the flat. With the base upside down, I can make some marks at the top of the legs for a cut that we're going to make later. These lines will just protect me from making a dumb mistake. I can also make some marks for the other details that I'd like to add to the stretcher and the rails. After I disassemble, I'll carefully label my parts so that I know where everything goes. Things are now in committed positions, so it's important to keep everything organized for the final glue up. To save time and stress, I'm going to pre-glue the tenons into the rails. I let the glue set up a bit before removing the excess with a chisel. I can now cut bevels on both edges of the stretcher just because I think it looks cool. Next, I want to add some gentle curves to the legs, so I'll actually go back and modify my template. It's not a lot of curvature, just, just a little taste. I also whip up a quick symmetrical curve template for the side rails. Now I can draw my curves and head to the bandsaw to cut them out. And once again, I'll use the router bit of death to flush trim. So I almost pushed this piece into the bit upside down. That would have been decidedly no bueno. Always double check your bearing location. Now all the parts get a nice little round over on the edges. Of course I take care to avoid the sections where another piece will connect. And now for some graceful sanding. Here I'll sand all the surfaces including the edges, faces, and profiles. 
that backside sandpaper really comes in handy. This is my backside, but this is backside sandpaper. It's double-sided sandpaper made right here in the Wood Whisperer shop. Grit on two sides means no folding and no frayed edges. You can get right into those intricate details and when the edge is spent, a quick cut with scissors and you're back in action. These are also great for sanding inside and outside curves as well as complex profiles. Because of the two-sided structure, the paper is also incredibly durable and the grit lasts a long time. So if you want to check this stuff out, go to BacksideSandpaper.com. Thanks for your support. Okay, let's assemble for realsies this time. Fortunately, as long as we don't mix up our parts, the glue-up should be pretty uneventful. Noise. With the side assemblies glued up, I can cut the bevels on the top and bottom. Remember the marks that I made when the base was upside down? Those will remind me of the bevel direction on each side assembly. These bevels allow the side assembly to sit at the appropriate angle. Track saw for the win on this one. Okay, now here's a little boo-boo. I didn't account for the fact that I was cutting a curve in the leg, so the apron face no longer looks parallel to the edge of the leg. To fix this, I'm going to send the aprons through the planer using a stack of blue tape as a shim to essentially change the angle of the apron face. Obviously, the correct shape would be just the segment of that curve in the leg, but the small segment can be approximated by a straight line as long as we make it at the correct angle. So I'm just sneaking up on it until it looks right. Good enough. By the way, the other dude that you'll see in the shop here periodically is Matt, a guild member that joined me for a week as part of our guild apprenticeship program. And he couldn't have arrived at a better time as this assembly really benefits from an extra set of hands. Unfortunately, I was born with only two. To buy us more assembly time, we'll be using Titebond's liquid hide glue. In addition to the long working time, it's also nice because it doesn't swell the joints as much as regular water-based glue, which can sometimes be a real problem on glue-ups that require extra fussing time. Tighten that one down a little bit. If you can, lift the head slightly. That's what he says. Damn it. All right, there you go. Good? Yep. Okay, so now for the top. I have a bunch of Live Edge four quarter walnut, and while I have no use for the Live Edge, I do have use for the brown stuff in between. So, bye bye, Live Edge. Because the boards are already at the thickness that I want, I'm not going to do any planing. And honestly, they're not perfectly flat. So I'm going to do something that I don't love doing, and that's simply joint the edges and hope for the best. With a lot of dominoes on the joints, we should be able to get a top that's mostly flat, or at least flat enough for a table. I have a full video focused on making big panels that stay flat the proper way, so if you want to dig into that, go check out that link in the description. Any knots were filled with epoxy and left to cure overnight. The next day we sanded the glue, leveled the surface where we could, and then sanded thoroughly. The top was then trimmed to final dimension with the track saw. So here's one of the dangers of using the domino in a tabletop. Sometimes you forget where your cuts will be and the cut exposes a domino. I'm actually not sure what happened here because in this case, there's no domino, but there is a domino hole. And I was very careful with the placement of the actual dominoes. I think I might blame Matt. So I show Matt how we fix stupid mistakes like this by patching it. 
we decided to add some jazz to the top in the form of gentle curves. And funny enough, those curves ended up completely cutting away the repair that I did. So, yay, I guess? Ooh, look at my fancy butthole. I cut the bulk of the material away with a jigsaw and then made a template so that I could flush trim with a router. For the long edge, I made a half template, which allows me to not only have a shorter template, but ensures that the curve will be symmetrical. My brother requested round corners, so I'll just use a big washer to establish the shape and then cut and sand it smooth. The rest of the edges will also be sanded through the grits. So now for something different. And no, I don't mean the Shaper Origin. Because this table is for my brother, I couldn't not do something ridiculous. Look, he's been in London for 10 years and I barely got to see him, let alone make furniture for him. So like any self-respecting woodworking brother, I went the extra mile and routed a very special epoxy inlay into the underside. I'm not gonna tell you what the shape is, but I am gonna tell you that I thought long and hard about it. If you could see it, you'd certainly stand erect and take notice and this could very well represent the climax of my career. You might be wondering who would go through the trouble and expense of building this beautiful walnut table just to inlay something like this on the underside. Me. I would. To really make the edges look nice, I'll add a fingernail profile. It's subtle, but adds a touch of class, and the spagnolos are nothing if not classy. The top gets a nice little edge round over to finish it off, and then a final sanding. For the finish, I'm using some catalyzed lacquer. The top and the base will receive about three coats. I don't spray lacquer much anymore, but it's hard to argue with the efficiency of the spraying process. On a warm day, you can easily apply three to four coats. To attach the top, I'll use some Izzy Skirt Washers. These are a nice improvement over classic figure eight fasteners. We'll center the base on the top and then attach it with screws. Well, there it is. A table fit for a prince. Here are some pretty shots so you can see all the details. After the table had a few days to cure, we delivered it to my brother. Give it a hard turn. Give it a hard turn. It's I'm gonna go upstairs. I'm gonna go upstairs. You like it? And had a nice family dinner. Vodka rigatoni, if you wanna know. Few projects give me more gratification than the ones that are made for family. And given the sparseness of my brother's house right now, I see a lot of gratification in my future. I think Ozzy approves.
brown. What color is this wiener? I've got some white stuff and almost like a white glitter type material, that, and I think it'll look pretty sweet on a dark wiener. Beautiful, wood. yeah. It's gonna be a beautiful wiener. <laughs> it's a big chubby wiener. <laughs> Todd's gonna like editing this. Just the right color, Todd. Is that a hair gel? Yeah, I tell you, engraving that wiener is way better than any day I've had in the office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.